Welcome back, week two. We are so excited to be here with you and share some more amazing content. And I just want to introduce your host, Walter Clark. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, we are here again, uh, and we'll be here for the next uh, six Tuesdays. We're jam-packed with just really an amazing lineup of speakers. We have a real estate panel. Uh, we have uh, Howard Getson, who's going to talk about hedge funds, and then Todd Belfer will be with us at the end of the program to talk about private equity. So really, without any further ado, let's really um, get after it. W what I really start out with every week is just a quick review of what we did the week before. So the main theme of, of what we did last week really is was centered around the individual and around behavioral issues about why we don't accomplish the things that we set out to. And so why does goal setting not work? What, 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 what is happening? So in, in the question is, is what, what is happening in your life that's, that's not working? So it's really not just a quest for money. So I've, I've seen over the years, as people come into the class, they, they want something. They want an amount of money, they want amount of income, but they lose sight of what ultimately is truly important around why they need that. And, and so in this particular example, we see the, 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 the nature of how we, um, how we chase something that we think externally will make us, uh, make us feel better. But what I, what I know and what I notice, and as I've gone back and I looked at, at various people that, that have come to the class and have been a big influence on myself, is they don't focus on money, they focus on impact. And so the Im impact in their business and their families and inside the community, and that ultimately, as a byproduct, translates into, into wealth, but a different kind of wealth. It's not monetary wealth. It's, it's, it's wealth, yes, monetarily, but it's also wealth. Um, it's, it's internal. What's super important and something that I want to um, kind of identify is if something's not working in your life and you have tried repeatedly to overcome that particular obstacle, it's, it's likely that you have an inability to solve that particular equation, meaning that the person that got you there probably isn't the person that delivers you into a new future. And so, Tyler, if we can move into my iPad for a second, I've drawn a little, um, a little stick figure here. So, so what you have here is you have a little box called your past, and your past is a tremendous influencer in your in your future because it's all those messages and, and experiences that drive us into the future and so what we have into the middle is we have today and so if you take the same set of behaviors and you say the same set of conditions you're likely to continue along the same trajectory even though you want something different so I draw this arrow which is which is here and that's, that's that change element. That's the change that you need in going back and really looking at your past and saying, okay, what, what gets in my way around either physical limitations? Because, you know, who doesn't want to be more fit? Who doesn't want to lose weight? Who doesn't want to have those things in your life? Maybe it's, maybe it's family. It, how is your relationship, your marriage, your relationship with your kids? How's your business? Um, you can be successful in your business, but how are, are people in and around your business, your staff, your, you know, your employees, your customers? And then lastly, the fourth leg of, of it is, is community. So for me, what I recognized in my life is if I just continue, I continue to take myself wherever, wherever I was. And so what Melanie brought to the table last week was just changing our consciousness, changing our mind, quieting our mind, and bringing in new possibilities around how we can effectuate change. But I think you have to get honest around if something's not working in your life, what's going to be different, and how are you going to affect change? So as we do that inside the family dynamic, inside the wealth wheel, that in itself is then a catalyst for change, which then can generate a new outcome and a new family goal. So here's, here's the big question that we move into uh, from tonight. It's, it's we have this shift. We, we, we move from earned income to portfolio income. And I love Tony Robbins' quote because we're really in the, in the trade of time for money. I talk to my kids about this all the time. It's like you're setting yourself as an engine, as an earner, whereby you increase your skill set, which then increases your income. But that's the trade. 
That's the trade for time for money. So where, where do we head and where do we want to go tonight as we move further into portfolio design, asset allocation, risk return, really what we call mailbox money. It's called, we have an acronym for it, it's called MIM, it's money in the mail. Can imagine that you walk out to your mailbox every day and there's just checks in the mail. And those checks um, equal your financial freedom. So tonight we're gonna, we're gonna focus on three very different types of portfolio design and we'll further amplify them in weeks three and four but we're really going to talk about them tonight so we, we did it a little bit last week where we talked about factor investing and factor is is that mechanism where we discover those premiums that you know small stocks do better than large value does better than growth and that high profitability companies do better than low profitability companies so that's the factor and then just pure passive you know if you have an allocation and you just buy index funds um, that's a particular strategy and then lastly then there's active what what can you do to be active inside your portfolio John Soforic, uh, the last speaker last week talked about his strategy which was rehab and homes and so he was very active in that process so therefore because of that he generated uh, better returns and accelerated his retirement quicker because that active component so it's really not one size fits all it's just what's what's right for you and your own personal experience so this is the transition. It's the transition from an earner to enjoyment. So it's, it's, it's actually a bridge that, you know, some people have a hard time is because they define themselves and who they are based on what they do and they, ha and they derive a tremendous amount of their own self-worth in their, in their profession. So as a business transaction itself, sometimes people have a very difficult time moving from the earner to the enjoyer where they oftentimes lose their purpose. But as you look at that, it can be a completely new set of, of objectives that happen in that enjoyment phase. It can happen a lot of, a lot of different ways. So we talked about 4%. 4% is the, is the number that you can distribute out of a portfolio, but then you gotta factor in inflation. So it's just not 4% is a gross return, it's 4% plus two and a half equals about a six and a half percent nominal return which is what's necessary in order to increase the portfolio and yet keep that 4% distribution intact because inflation is a, is a uh, threat that, that we all have to deal with. Uh, costs are rising at, uh, at, a, at a rapid rate. So, so what is portfolio freedom or life freedom? And there are a lot of definitions for it in, in the class and what I try to teach kids, it's when your portfolio income matches your current expenses. People say, well, how much do I need? How much will I need in retirement? Don't really know. But how much are you currently spending now? And wouldn't it be cool that you could operate by choice, meaning that you have portfolio income or passive income that equals your expenses. So you're just walking into work every day just because that's what you want to do and that's where you derive a lot of pleasure, but it's not out of necessity. You have a lot of choices at that point in time. A lot of choices, uh, you can go a lot of places. So then the, the question then becomes as we start to look at allocation, do I have the right allocation? What's the mix of stocks and bonds that should be appropriate for me given where I'm at? Well, this whole entire discussion really depends on where you're at in the, in the particular cycle. So as we look at um, accumulation and distribution, what we see is is we're adding money in the accumulation phase, so we're a little bit different, and then we move into the distribution phase, which is that portfolio income. Uh, Tyler, if you could switch to my pad. Um, what, what I've shown here, and I'll kind of just blow this up for a second, is in that distribution picture, kind of looks like your uh, amount of money is declining, which people can spend down principal during retirement. That's, that's perfectly acceptable, it just depends on what it is that you're trying to do in terms of what your goals are. But you can also have that principal value be steady or you can have it increase depending upon your level of wealth. So as you're increasing it, one of the objectives there is that you're gonna transition money to future generations and if there's a lot of money, um, it will be multi-generational. So, so there's all kinds of different things to think about in terms of where you're at in the cycle, whether you're in accumulation or distribution. And that's ultimately going to affect 
what your allocation is going to be between your, your asset mix. And so what are we trying to do tonight? Uh, well, we're, we're trying to create education around what allocation is, what risk return is, and we're trying to create something that can weather storms. We've Obviously, we're in one uh, which, which, you know, month, month and a half ago in the, in the COVID uh, price. It doesn't seem like it now because of where, how far the markets have recovered, but, but when we're in them, they seem very fearful and very ugly, and they seem very, very different. So we want to try to attempt to um, handle our emotions. So one of the main objectives is can we provide an allocation that can create consistent returns? Then create this, this mailbox money, which in essence gives you peace and comfort that every month I got X amount coming in, and I'm, I'm just going to be okay regardless of the storm. So who would like that? I think we all would like the peace of mind to know that if we can get more mailbox money, how do we get there? So that's the, that's just, that's the entire conversation tonight about how to create portfolio income that's consistent and stable and reliable that when something like a COVID, a banking crisis, um, the tech wreck, um, high interest rates, whatever it is, um, you can survive those various uh, types of uh, events. Portfolio return, where does it come from? So one, it comes from the appreciation of your stock. So you buy a stock and it appreciates or depreciates in value, but we really want it to over time increase in value. We also get dividends and income from stocks. So there's many stocks that pay a dividend, we get the dividend regardless of whether the stock goes up or down. Now, in times of crisis like we're in right now or the banking crisis, a lot of stocks that had dividends cut their dividends. So then all of a sudden you got a, you got a pay cut because of the particular economic environment that they're not always, they're not always guaranteed. So typically a portfolio will generate, depending upon how it's structured and depending upon how much income component comes from stocks, will be somewhere between one and two percent. Well, we said that we need about six and a half percent, so there's a shortfall. So where does that where does that come from? And this is an interesting chart here. And this kind of talks about people used to, or they still do, but but they relied um, over the years more on dividends than they did the appreciation of the stock. And so you can see the relationship between appreciation and dividend yield based on decade. And so when we start talking about stocks, we know that stocks have a higher expected return than bonds, but bonds are more stable. So when we go back to this chart and we look at the, the, the decade returns, you know, you'll notice that, that stocks typically over decades are always positive, except that nasty decade of the 2000 and they were slightly negative. And so as stocks have appreciated over the years, the dividend yield has gotten less and less. It's smaller and smaller component and we're relying more on, on appreciation. And this is just what's, what's happened with interest rates. Interest rates in the, in the early 80s was close to 18% and, and now they're, they're almost next to zero. So on the safe side of the, of the allocation, we have bond yields that are very low. We then have dividend yields that are very low. So we have this reliance which is the shortfall that we need appreciation in our stocks to get us to that six and a half percent return that we need. It's just what is. And that's that appreciation. But hold on a second. And so let's try to put some logic to why stocks do what they do. So in the long term, stocks go up because of how much money they make. They make they, do, they, they, they go up based on earnings. They go up based on how much money they make because they can do a number of different things with those dollars. They can push them out in the form of, divi of a dividend. They can reinvest in the business and buy other businesses and grow even faster. Or they can buy their stock back, which is a common place for companies. So there's, there's lots of different ways that earnings sort of affect that. And we have this, this formula not to be kind of too technical, but it's called a, a price earnings ratio. And that basically takes the price of the stock and it divides it by its, its um, earnings per share and it comes up to a formula. And so 
you hear this a lot in the press around price earnings ratio. It's, it's the stock market is either overvalued or undervalued. Well, this chart's interesting because there's a relationship between interest rates and, and price earnings ratio that's somewhat interesting. And historically, the price earnings ratio of stocks has been about 15. And what happens though is in recent times, because interest rates are so low, and interest rates and interest rate vehicles like bonds compete for a part of the allocation. So just think about it this way. When, when interest rates are high and you can get six and seven, eight percent from a stable bond, which you could in the 80s and sometimes in the 90s, you are less likely to buy stocks because stocks are much riskier and have higher degree of variability. But when interest rates are low, people are like, wow, you know, why do I want to own something that's going to pay me 1% to 2%, and by the time I pay tax and inflation, where does that get me? So there is a relationship between competition. When rates are low, it actually pushes people to increase their allocations into equity investments. Therefore, uh, stocks in, in these kinds of low interest rates environments warrant a little bit of a higher uh, ratio. And so you see that the range of the price earnings ratio varies dramatically. In, in 2000, it reached historic proportions before we had the, the crash. So just because it's 15 doesn't mean that it can't go higher or lower based on fear and greed inside the market. So this is really kind of an interesting kind of baseline. However, what we know from these kinds of things, it's very difficult to make any kind of long-term decisions based on this kind of data because we just don't know where ratios are going to be you know, in the future. And this market environment has been so classic, like the market went down 34% in literally 21, 22, 23 days. And everybody was running for cover, the world was shut down. You know, th there was just seemed to be no end in sight. But then all of a sudden something happened and it turned on a dime and it's recovered um, the majority of what it lost in that short period of time. So that's why trying to figure out where things are going is very, very difficult. Then when we look at kind of the long term and we look at, you know, um, small stocks, large stocks, government bonds and treasury bills, we see a very, very different picture over this long period of time. We see what we call this upward sloping trajectory where it looks good that, hey, stocks are pretty reliable over the long period of time provided we have the stomach to stay uh, with them during times um, like we just experienced. So really in the short run, what can happen? Well, anything, anything. Because markets are, are what's called forward looking in the short term. They're always trying to figure out what's gonna happen the next six or nine months. And oftentimes they're very wrong about that anticipation. And so that's what we saw happen as the economy shut down and the market fell because they're like, okay, how's this pandemic going to affect all these different industries. What's interesting is when the market sells off like this, it sells everything off, it sells everything off. And so there were retailers, especially online retailers and then big box stores that did very well in this environment, but their stocks went down significantly as well with the airlines and with tourism. So that's what happens. So it's forward looking. So that's why in the short run, it's so, so very difficult to really figure it out. So one of the objectives tonight is how do we craft an allocation that can weather these storms, keep you in the game, and set rules and systems to where you'll know what to do when the market goes up and then when the market goes down. Because here's the other side of that equation in terms of this chart. It just shows you the frequency in which these declines happen. So, you know, bear markets, which are declines of 20% or less, typically happen about every three and a half years, but we hadn't seen one since the decline of 2009. We almost got there in 2018. Towards the end, we were down about 18%, and then we came roaring back. But remember what happened in 2018. Markets went down, and they went down in a hurry, and everybody said, okay, run for cover. This is it. This is the correction that we've been all been looking for. And people band together and they start having that conversation. There's mountains and mountains of evidence about 
what's around the corner and you absolutely think it's a, it's a, it's a truck. But then what happened in 2019? I mean, the market was incredible. It just took off and it rallied and it was up 30 plus percent. And it really caught the market timers by surprise. And then we went into 2020 and it really set itself up for some really amazing things. And then we got hit with COVID. We got hit with something that we couldn't even see. And, and, and that's really, that's, that's the forecasting element. How do, we, how do we get there? And what you know, Warren Buffett says, and I got quotes littered throughout the program about Warren, you know, he, just, he basically says you can't forecast. They never forecast. So if the smartest guy on the planet doesn't forecast, who is it for me? And who is it for you to try to forecast? So what's, what's the enemy? The enemy's emotion. The enemy is you getting in fear or greed and making decisions based on that particular emotion. You know, let's look at this. This is, this is, the, this is the recent events. And this is what happened. You see how fast it went? The, the, the market was phenomenal. And then all of a sudden, COVID hit. And within you know, a very, very short period of time, um, uh, we were down 34%. And because it was different, is it different or it was, is it the same? And, and I would argue it's the same. The event is different, but the way that we handle crisis is the same. There's, there's a weakness that happens inside the economy. And whatever happens in the particular sector, the government recognizes that it lowers interest rates and then it provides stimulus to the economy to get it going again. And because we just have this unlimited printing press, that's, that's what we do. We backstop business, we backstop industry. That's what happened in the 08, 09 era. And that's exactly what happened with COVID. That's one of the reasons, you know, you try to speculate about why we've recovered is because the government has basically said, look, listen, we will turn on the printing press at a level that's somewhat unprecedented whereby we will make sure that, that we come out of this, this crisis. And then right after that, we've got a global cooperation trying to get us to a vaccine. So that's why the, the market's up, because it's like it's not as bad as, as we really thought it was. So here's the poll really quickly. I got really you know, three questions that I'd like to ask is, um, what did you do? So during this crisis, what did you do? So a little, little audience participation. One, did you buy in the downturn or buy or rebalance? Because I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but it's buy or rebalance. Um, did you sell um, or number three, did you do nothing? And number four, Walter, I'm just not saying anything because I don't want to be embarrassed. So this is, um, this is anonymous. And so if we can just do that really quickly. <laughs> so it's great, but do, do, do you see how um, those statistics are? Because we're going to talk about rule-based investing, and I'm going to really encourage you to do that because it completely strips out the emotion because we went down so fast that people just said, hey, I'm, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but... I did a, a film with Patrick in the studio right at the depth of the decline, and I did some math, and if your allocation was 70-30, there was about an eight percentage point differential because of the depth of the decline just in the, just in the 23 days. So if you had a rules-based approach, and there was a trigger that said any time you get below a five or six percent threshold, you would have sold bonds, which are the assets that were safe and stable, and bought more stocks. And that would have had a significant effect as the market came back. So when you got to make decisions and you're being inundated with negative news, it's much, much more difficult to do that. And that's why the majority of the people you know, on this poll just did nothing because it was like wait and see. But rules base happens automatically. You don't have to, you don't have to really do anything. Okay. So we then go through um, bear markets and corrections. And what we recognize is every time there's a bear market, then there's a corresponding correction. And so now we're going to move into 
you know, building the house, building the allocation. And I, I love, I love the three little pigs because people build their allocations in very much the same way, out of sticks, out of wood, and out of bricks. And they have different, they have different levels of, of staying power. So this, this rules-based is super critical. So there's, there's three things that matter that generate returns. When people say, okay, where does return come from? Number one is allocation, the, the, the mix between stocks and bonds. Number two is selection. What do you buy? Do you buy index funds or you know, uh, mutual funds? What, what do you buy? Number three is rebalancing. And four is repeat. So wait a minute, let me, let me do that again. I'm going to just go back. So decide what your allocation is based on what your MIM needs are. Remember what your MIM needs are, money in the mail. Then have a selection process. Then rebalance based on thresholds. So when the market goes down, you automatically are selling what's working and buying what's not working. And the deeper it goes, the more frequently you rebalance. In the 08 and 09, if, if it was done properly, you probably rebalance two, three times. Two or three times. And then repeat. So how, how simple is that? So Tiffany is signaling we have a question. What is our question, Tiffany? Uh, Carrick said, would you say the market hasn't seen its worst? You know, Boy, we, we, could, we could pull a lot of people around that, and there's like many, many different opinions. I'll go back to what I call the consensus coming out of the 08 and 09 time period when the government was flooding money into um, the world, and, 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 and there were governments that were on the teeter of financial collapse, and there was just a flood of money. So everybody said, well, we got inflation's right around the corner, and so interest rates are going to rise, and we're going to get inflation. Remember that? And people said you need to buy gold and safe fats coming out of the 09 downturn because of economically what's happened. That was, the, that was kind of universally, categorically the opinion. Completely wrong. Gold was the wrong thing to own and interest rates didn't go up in any significance. So I have, I have no idea. Warren Buffett has no idea. The, the, the point is, is that the government is going to backstop this pandemic and whatever is going to happen is going to be not what everybody says is going to happen. And so when we were down 34%, everybody said, hey, we're going down a lot further. But that's not what happened. It stopped and it reversed. So in terms of, of everyone's longevity, it's, it's even hard to remember 08 and 09 because it's a blip and the markets have recovered. We don't, we don't remember it like we remember today. And even now, with the market having, having recovered, it just doesn't even seem like the same event, even though the crisis is real, but business is restarting and people are starting to fly again and pretty soon people are going to stay in hotels and people are going to go on vacation and, and we're going to look back two, three, four years from now and know that staying invested and having a rules-based approach is way more effective than turning on CNBC trying to figure out what somebody's telling you to do. So what's the response? What, what, what's the market response to crisis? So when we're in it, the market always recovers. So when we look at this particular slide, we, we see the effect of one, three, and five years later. That is you know, really you know, super, you know, super important. So now we have this income and appreciation equals return. And we, we recognize that returns are very, very unpredictable. And they've, they've got this, this element to them that oftentimes you know, throws us off our game. And, and the reason it throws us off our game is we spend just mounds of time accumulating wealth. And then we make a business transaction, we sell our business, and, and then all of a sudden in, in 21 days, we see 30% of our wealth that's in stocks wiped out. I'll tell you, that has, that has a tremendous view on our psyche if we're not prepared to understand that that's what stocks do. But they also come back very fast. I mean, after they were down 34%, we had the best week, don't quote me on this, but I, I think in history. Uh, there might have been one after the Depression, but we had the best week ever. 
And typically that happens as a result of declines. So people get out very quick, they come back out very quick. Our job as, as investors, because remember, we're not, we're not dealing in months, we're dealing in decades. We're trying to craft something that has a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 year time horizon that's effective that we don't have to sit back and, and worry to try to figure out what we do. 